Good morning, good afternoon, good everybody. We are happy to have you here. I think we have something very interesting for you today. Uh, we have, uh, as um, first of all, uh, welcome to the HR Circle. We are uh, building a, a library of um, interview on mover and shakers in HR and in global HR, I like to say. So I'm Chiara Bersano and I live in Italy. Here is uh, Luke Marson with me. And our guest of honor today is Enrique Rubio. Hello. Enrique is uh, well known for, has been passionate about HR for uh, a long time, I think. And uh, he has founded a grown hacking HR from a very small connected community years ago. And I think I started following you years ago, Enrique, yeah. to a huge conference nowadays. And that's uh, amazing the amount of hits you get. And I think next year we're pla you're planning to go in presence, at least. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, which is brilliant. We're all waiting for that. We're all thirsty for in presence. <laughs> How did you come around to creating a, an HR conference? Why did you get the idea? How did it happen? Yeah, well, uh, uh, Chiara, look, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the uh, conversation. And the conference is one of the many elements and one of the many offerings that we have at Hacking HR. We, before the first conference, which was fully online and fully free, and this was back in 2020, March of 2020. Before that, we had been doing a lot of smaller in-person events around the world, uh, a lot of very small uh, online panels. And then we said, you know, maybe we should have a one week that is our week of the year to do a conference where we bring everybody together online. And it's just a celebration of HR, but also a way to inspire and move this career for this career and field forward. That's how the idea of creating the conference, the Hacking HR Global Online Conference, uh, came about. One of the perhaps the two elements that I want to highlight here is number one, we started planning the conference before COVID. So we started planning the conference in November of 2019. By then, no, I think none of us, most of us, didn't know anything about COVID, and. We always wanted the conference to be both online, meaning virtual and free. Because you know there are so many events in the HR space out there and they are so expensive and it's just so hard to attend. And what I wanted to do was let's remove any barrier that anybody in the world could have to join this global, amazing and powerful conversations. And I did that. That's what I did it. You know, that's, that's why um, I wanted to do it free and virtual. So that's how the idea, the idea came about, and that's why it's free and virtual. Well, it's it's an amazing uh, feat because we uh, we know how complex it is from the point of view of organization. Yeah. And you actually work across the world. You, you have yeah. attendees, not only attendees, but conferencing and speakers from across the world. That's not the minor fact. No, it, it is actually a very difficult thing to do. I, I invest hours and hours in researching, curating, and inviting speakers to be part of the conference. And uh, in the first conference in 2020, we had 225 speakers. Then last year, 2021, and this year, 2022, we had 500 speakers. But it's not that I just invite somebody and they say yes right away. I mean, it's, it takes time. And generally, I send out between five and 10,000 invitations. I mean, there are people who cannot make it. There are people who don't want to join. There are people who never respond to my invite. That's part of, the, you know, part of doing this. So I end up having 500 awesome speakers. But creating the list of the other you know, 9,000 that I actually invite, that takes a lot of energy and a lot of time, about 40 percent of them are not located in the United States, which is where I am located. And I like that because I, one of the things that I enjoy the most in the events that we put together in all of the events, including our global conference, is the international global view of HR and workplace issues. That to me is very, very important to be able to generate those 
collisions of ideas, experiences, stories to generate those connections that to me is cornerstone of this, not only the movement that I'm uh, leading with Hacking HR, but of the specific offerings like the conference. So you mentioned different offerings. Do you want to details a little bit what uh, you're thinking, what have you launched, what, uh, what you're offering, what's in your yeah. plan? Well, we have, we have a platform that is called the Hacking Nature Lab, and we have about 30 plus thousand members right now in the Hacking Nature Lab. They get access to most of the things that we have in there are free and some things are premium. Uh, meaning people have to pay for a membership to get access to that. But we have, you know, we have a daily podcast that we put out, you know, every day. We only, the only month that we didn't do it was be between the end of December of 2021 and mid-January of 2022, because we wanted to take a little break. But since August of 2020, we have been uh, uh, sort of running that daily podcast and we're getting closer now to 500 episodes in a little over a year. And we have the we have we we do about one or two events per month with anywhere between uh, five six panels to up to twelve panels. Meaning each of those events that we do a month generates you know ten plus hours of content. It brings together forty fifty speakers, and we do that every month, and they're all free. So that's part of our offering. And we have other stuff you know other events. We have other learning programs that are embedded and more automated in our Hacking Nature Lab. The ones that we put more energy in, just because they are, they require more hands-on kind of a, a in time investment, it's the, the events that we put together and they are the conference and the many other smaller panels that we put together throughout the year. So wow. how do you find so many guests to do a podcast <laughs> every day? That's, that, that is just an incredible effort. That is an incredible amount of people. Yes, um, you know, out of the almost 500 guests that we have, and I think we are, um, we're getting there. I don't know exact, the exact number right now. We may have repeated, you know, maybe like 40 of them or 30 of them. The majority are, you know, one time kind of speakers. The, generally, they are the same people that I invite to speak at our events, meaning that it's easier for me to just do curation one time. Uh, so I, you know, I look at somebody and I say, this person is awesome to be part of our conference or to be part of our events. I invite that person. And once they are in our network, meaning they, they have said yes to joining us in any capacity, then I invite them to be part of our, uh, of our podcast. Uh, and at the end of last year, at the end of 2021, we launched our Hacking HR Experts Council, which is a community of HR leaders that are, uh, 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 they are either director VP, SVP, or CHRO, or CPO in companies that are larger than 100 people. We created this council to, first of all, bring them together, and second, to generate content with that council. And right now, we're getting closer to 400 council members, and they are founding members of the Hacking Nature Council. And all of them are invited to be part of our events. They are all invited to be part of our, of our podcast. So, you know, I, I take advantage of the work that I do to curate one list. And once I get all those people engaged, I invite, invite them to everything that, they, that we do and they decide if they want to join or not. But uh, that makes it a little bit easier for me than having to, you know, to look at different lists of people all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, your passion is contagious, but yeah, thank still, you. <laughs> you need it's a to lot of work going through the whole, uh, the whole approach. Yeah. yeah it, and, it's uh, a lot of work. Yeah, it is. It is. We know how difficult it is to find relevant people to yeah. bring into a, an interview or a podcast. We've, yeah. We're have we doing it. And it's yeah. very slow as a side job. So uh, kudos to the work you're doing. It's fantastic. Uh, given that you work in a global environment, how do you see differences by, by region or U.S. versus rest of the world or Europe when we talk about global community and uh, trends, either of HR, of HR, really, because we're... You know, I, I see, it's, it's interesting <laughs> because I, I see more similarities than differences between the challenges that we're dealing with around the world. Of course, the way you resolve those challenges varies a lot. Uh, you know, it's not the same thing as, you know, even even within the United States, for example, you know, if you try to resolve a 
talent problem for the technology sector in California, most likely the answer or the solution would be significantly different than trying to resolve for the manufacturing sector in the Midwest. You know, so it's it's uh, even within the U.S. there are many nuances and flavors to the solutions that we have, but the problems are pretty much the same. Problems around retaining, uh, attracting, and retaining great talent, uh, creating a workplace where culture is conducive to a great human experience at work, creating a workplace where we're taking care of the mental health and the uh, and the well-being and wellness of our people. Um, making sure that we are upskilling and reskilling our workforce fast, fast enough to be able to respond to the demands of, you know, of our environment and to uh, make sure that we are not uh, short skilled, you know, in terms of the, uh, the people that we have on board. Uh, another thing that comes up all the time is the impact of technology in the workforce, in organizations. So these challenges are, you know, pretty much the same everywhere. I just see differences uh, more in the um, in the way we resolve them, especially because of the nature and the cultures and the geographical uh, specificities of each region and each country, mm-hmm. which is, by the way, one of the reasons why I love bringing the community, the international community together. Because if you have a problem and you're solving it in one way in California, And another company in Singapore has the same problem and they are solving it in a different way. When you talk to your peers about the same problem, you get to understand how everybody's solving those problems. And that's generating more, uh, that's generating more value because you're learning from what others are doing and perhaps maybe getting inspired to do things that you didn't think about before. So um, that to me, it's, uh, it's part of this core value, you know, bringing that community together so that even when we are dealing with similar challenges, we can explore together solutions that, you know, each of us is implementing in a different way, but learning from each other. That makes sense. Uh, I I never thought of seeing it from a difference of solution rather than a different problem, but that makes completely sense and that speaks a lot to me. Um, You mentioned technology. And I know you have a background somehow in technology. I do. How, how do you see that? Uh, uh, and I don't know how to phrase wow. the question. It's not really. Uh, I personally see technology as key to modern HR, but I think it's uh, it's not the solution. It's just the support. And that's just my point of view. I would be curious to hear, because you have such a different and open approach to these kind of things and both Luke and myself are into technology yeah <laughs> all the way till here <laughs> <laughs> well I love you know I love technology I don't think technology is the panacea that will solve all the problems that we have in the workplace uh, there's a very this is not just a semantic description a, a difference between thinking of technology as a, as the almighty you know problem solver in the workplace uh, versus uh, versus a, an enabler or a tool to enable us to do more, better, more effectively and efficiently. So the way I see technology in the workplace is as a tool that allows us to amplify our capacities, both physical capacities, cognitive capacities, to resolve problems in a more effective, efficient, and meaningful way. When we see technology, that with those lenses of, it's just, it's it's an extension of me, but it's not me then you can start thinking, all right, what is it that I can do to improve me as a process, improve me as an organization, and then bring that tool on board to, uh, you know, to help me out, do more and do better. Uh, The problem that I see today is that a lot of companies don't want to go through the hard exercise that implies looking carefully, scrutinizing with, you know, with, um, uh, you know, a clear, a clear vision of value, the process that you have in place. And because they don't want to do that, what ends up happening is that they bring technology on board thinking this will resolve the problems. What they don't realize is that down the road, that technology becomes an added headache because they didn't resolve the challenges that they had in the first place. Now they added another layer of complexity. So now they have two problems to resolve the original ones and the amplified problems that technology you know, is creating. Mm-hmm. So it's exactly. So if you don't go to the 
to the foundations of your problems. I mean, you can paint the house all the time and it will just break, the walls will break again because the foundations are not solid enough. So that's how I see technology. I see it as a tool that amplifies our capacities, that enables us to do more, better, more effectively, efficiently, and more meaningfully, but only if what that technology is amplifying and enhancing is good in the first place. If not, the technology will not, will not fix it for you. I think that's extremely true. The challenge sometimes, and and I speak from uh, from the from the point of view of an advisor to to people, and I'm sure Luke has something to say on that as well. Sometimes the problem is to help the customer or the counterpart to identify what the problem really is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that that that, that makes sense. It's hard. It's a hard exercise, uh, especially when you want to do something, you, you know. Uh, quick enough as to say that you resolved a problem, but then the problem really persists because you didn't solve it in the first place. You just added a layer of technology that makes it seem as if, if, as if things are better, but they really are not. So, And I have gone through this experience myself in my previous um, sort of corporate experience. You know, I looked at you know, companies bringing X, you know, X technology on board, Y technology on board, and every, everybody's happy, like, look how awesome this technology is. And then what ends up happening or what ended up happening is that we had to adjust our behaviors to fit into the technology instead of having the technology fit into what we wanted it to do in the first place. So it's like, it's like the wrong, uh, it's like the wrong approach, uh, if you will. So my advice to anybody who is, who knows that technology can help them is begin with the process, begin with the mindset, begin with the changes uh, and the transformations that need to happen uh, on a more strategic and process oriented kind of uh, approach and then bring the technology on board. That makes sense. Luke, do you have something you want to add? I mean, I can just 100% agree with that. It's uh... It's really important for organizations, for HR to really figure out what their business problems are and where they want to go. I think you said, you know, the, the, the clarity of vision is really important. Um, technology, in my opinion, is the great enabler, but it doesn't solve problems on its own. And and yeah. I've I've seen this and I've seen vendors trying to position their software as the, the savior of the world. Yeah. But but ultimately, it, no, nothing's going to come along and, and and fix all your problems for you magically. You have to put in the hard work. Yeah. Just doing the software implementation is um, in itself actually in some ways a step backwards. Yeah. Because if you're using some technology, you have to be adding value to what you're doing. It has to be, yeah. in my opinion, these days, it has to be some kind of transformation taking place. No matter how small or how big that is, you have yeah. to be doing something of value um, to your organization. Improving a, a, an experience, um, making a process simpler and easier, removing barriers to getting things done, making yeah. the the experience of what you're doing better. Because if you don't, if you if you don't go forward, even just standing still will cause problems for your business in in the longer run. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is a hard exercise to do, by the way. You know, I mean, we 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 have to understand that. Looking at a looking at a nature process and saying this process is not adding value anymore, we got to uh, you know trim it out to something that is you know way more valuable and effective and efficient. That's hard to do, um, and it, it, and not only it's hard to do in HR, it's hard to do in life. You know, like whenever I have like a like an event or a panel or something, I always ask you know like uh, my 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 I try to always ask my guests uh, in the panels not only what we need to do differently and better, but what we have to stop doing. Because sometimes it's not just what we do, what pushes us forward, it's what we stop doing, what helps us you know, uh, you know, free ourselves from dead weights that may be damaging our function and our businesses. It's sometimes about what you don't do because humans hate change. And how many yeah. times have you been in the customer and they're like, we need to do this, you're like, why? Well, that's what we've always done. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it's like you, you have to change that mindset and that mentality yeah. away from looking backwards to looking forwards to to embrace new ideas and new possibilities. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What are other companies doing? What are some of the leading practices? 
why do we what really why do we have to do this specific part of this process or this process yeah. and really thinking that open mindsets that that change management mindset as well it's really it's different it's difficult and you know i think as one of my key pieces of advice would be is 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 to have organizations before they embrace any of these kind of initiatives is to spend some time really beginning to change the mindset yeah. of of the company change management from a really early period to start getting people to think about how they can look at things in different ways how they can find um, and realize different benefits that they hadn't thought of before yeah. because you can't just keep re you don't want to reinvent or, or move as you said move the same processes to a, to a new technology you're not solving anything there yeah really <clears throat> yeah i think the the comparing that uh, the comparison that um, Enri you and Enrique did a moment ago, the concept that technology can be like the paint you put on the walls, and yeah. in the end, it hides that the wall is crumbling down. Yeah. But that will not prevent the wall from crumbling down. And sometimes yeah. adding yeah. technology that creates something, a prettier process, but not necessarily a new process or a re engineered process, becomes uh, rather the uh, the blocker to seeing where the problems are than the solution itself. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, if, if again, if you bring technology on board and your wall has, you know, it's all, you know, has all these cracks and, and problems, you, you will end up making it worse. Whether you don't see it in the short term, that's what's going to happen. Um, uh, so, yeah, you know, I think, uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a component in there of process engineering, process redesign, uh, you know, change management, agility and innovation, mindset management, mindset change that is required before anything else. Uh, you know, you gotta you gotta answer to yourself too. Like, I mean, what do we want to be as a company, right? You know, what what do we want to offer our employees? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so you know, this technology conversation can be in itself an entire day of how to make it happen well i think that's a critical conversation to have in most situations because i i can hardly imagine today in the modern day and time seeing a function of hr uh, working without technology yeah i i, I don't think that's ever going to happen in any function not just HR, but anywhere else. True. Um, the, the question becomes, what do you want that technology to do? What do you want your humans to do? What do you want your processes to be? And even more importantly, sometimes, how are you planning to change your processes when you realize that your processes are not working anymore? Uh, you know, I have been in so many process re-engineering um, processes that, you know, people spend months working in something and then they feel that that's, you know, it's, it's written in the stone. You know, this is going to be the forever process. You have to also embed or build in the capabilities in whatever you're doing for the change of that something. That's what makes it really agile and flexible. And that's part of something that we don't do too often in HR. You know, we just design something and move on to the next thing without thinking, you know, what, what, what needs to happen for us to go back to this process and say it doesn't work anymore. And if that actually happens, how are we going to change the process? How can we be flexible enough to say we liked the process that we did, but the conditions are changing and the process doesn't make sense anymore. So we got to change it now. So to some extent, not only how we measure success, but how we measure the lack of success so we can plan a further change. Ab absolutely. Yes. Yes. That's, that's what it is because, you know, something successful today, I mean, imagine companies that were implementing, um, you know, like a, like a, like office perks back in at the beginning of 2020 and they all congratulated themselves of like, oh my gosh, we built an amazing benefit packages, you know, for people who are working in the office for them to feel comfortable here only to have two months later, everything shattered by the pandemic. Or even today, you know, some companies saying, okay, you know, we're planning the return to the office and look at these awesome things that we're designing. Maybe, hopefully not, but what if it's, what if in two months from now, there's another variant that like, it's actually, it's happening right now. You know, Philadelphia, I just read it this morning. Philadelphia just went into uh, a mandatory ma indoor mask policy again. 
uh, and it's the biggest city to have done so now in what is it today 12th of april yeah. because we see an uptick you know in china the 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 problem is significant with the uh, with the new, new variants of covid so if you designed a process to bring your people back to the office and you were doing so and now you got to go into remote work again you got to be flexible to be able to do that and you got to have the indicators that tell tell you it's time to go remote again you know even if we design a process that was very nice in the first place the process is about being agile and yeah. being able to change and adapt. Yeah, yeah. And flexibility about... is key at yeah. the moment and will yes. probably remain so for uh, the foreseeable future. I would say so. Yes, I think flexibility is um, flexibility, agility, innovation are the name of the game here um, because the reality is that, um, you know, we are constantly thrown into chaos, into disruption. <coughs> And the best thing that we can do is just acknowledge that sometimes we don't have the answers, but we have to be very agile, uh, very flexible, very innovative and open-minded to experiment with different ways of doing things. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that for the past couple of years, be since we've been in, into COVID times, you know, a lot of people are craving like a, like a return to normalcy or a return to having control over things that's never going to happen again because it's a pandemic today but tomorrow it is something else and the next year i mean who imagined that we were going to be witnessing in 2022 the invasion of one country by another country right i mean those are things that you you speculate that they could happen but you would never think that they will actually happen uh, and none of us plan for that a lot of companies withdrew from uh, from Russia. A lot of companies are operating in different ways just because they have to be flexible about that. So next year can be something else. And we just have to be flexible. Well, it has been something else before. It will be something else again. It, yeah. what, you know, the concept of emergencies is that they happen all the time. Yeah. And what we can, the only thing we can do is to figure out to control, to control the contingencies so it doesn't become a permanent crisis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and and again, you know, very often we find ourselves in a position of not knowing how to respond, and that is okay. What you have to be, what you have to have embedded in your function, in your practice, in yourself, is the flexibility, the learning, how to learn sort of capabilities, right? Because when you are thrown into chaos, but you have learned the, your muscle of learning is a strong, you're going to learn how to get out of that chaos or how to manage, you know, your reality in the, you know, amid that chaos. The worst thing that can happen is that you are thrown into chaos and that you try to resolve that with the very same things that you used before that are not applicable anymore or not relevant anymore. And I see a lot of that. I mean, look at what, what, what happens today in the world of leadership and in the world of management. Why is that so many companies want to go back to normal as in working from an office? Because they are incapable to changing their leadership and management styles to a different way of working. Uh, it's not that there's no data that says that working from an office is better, more efficient, that collaboration happens more naturally, that innovation emerges more often working from an office versus working in a remote environment. It's all about having the mindset of saying, we are thrown into this new way of working. Let's see how we can manage through it. Instead of saying, oh, my old models don't work in this new way of working. Let's try to bring back the old way of working. I mean, that's like trying to bring the, you know, the Gutenberg printing press back to the year 2022 because you don't know how to use a computer, you know? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. And that's actually, that's very close to everything you have been doing uh, in the last years, because you've been enabling learning remotely for a whole community that you've been building. So I guess the next year, uh, we are going to be trying to be in Arizona. And if we cannot uh -huh. be in Arizona, we'll be attending <laughs> remotely, but it will be still efficient and still a fabulous yeah. event, I'm sure. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I hope we can make it happen in person. But even if not, we are going to make it happen uh, online for sure and continue bringing all these conversations and ideas to the community. Well, I do have it on my calendar, and I plan to be there. Hopefully, it will work. And otherwise, we'll figure out another way.
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kiara, and look for inviting me. Thank you so me. much for being here with us. Great conversation. Fantastic. Thank you, so thank you. And a good day, a good evening, and a good night. Thank you for our listeners. And until next time.